without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Um, we are going to have a little bit of a different format this month and uh, have some discussion about future activities um, and, and what the plans are going forward uh, post passage of the FASD Respect Act. Um, I do want to remind folks that this is a collaboration between uh, parents and caregivers, um, self advocates with FASD and professionals in the field. So we want to make sure that as we're having these discussions and we're putting things in the chat, we are being respectful to all parties concerned, making sure we're using person first language for people with FASD and acknowledging their strengths as well as things that they may struggle or have challenges with and areas of support needed. Um, but I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to this. I think this is going to give us some good strategic direction going forward. So um, before we get to that, I'm going to ask Tom to kick it off with a little bit of a, uh, an update uh, around what's going on at FASD United. Um, and uh, Tom, also, if you can address the, uh, the red shoes in the room. <laughs> Hello, Jen. Yes, indeed. I don't have mine on yet, but I will uh, on November 15th. You know, it's a little quiet here in, uh, in Washington uh, on Capitol Hill. Uh, but just through the election and then uh, Jen and Susan and, and the team and you all will have the volume all the way back up because there's going to be a little window there as General has already mentioned before, but we'll share again of, of opportunity before this Congress ends and boy, <laughs> we've got our fingers crossed. So that's very exciting. And speaking of exciting, uh, here you see uh, November 15th, so uh, less than three weeks away. Uh, this is uh, our first in-person event uh, in, in three years, so we're excited about that. Uh, the uh, an important night, you, the proceeds are important so we can keep doing all this work and even expand it. So uh, uh, it's, it's our biggest fundraising event of the year. And uh, we're gonna have some some key people there, Senator Murkowski, we hope, Senator Collins, uh, also Betty McCollum, who has been extraordinary, she and her office uh, for, for a couple of years now. So we're grateful for that. So. Uh, Click on the link there because there's always uh, new information about the event, who's going to be there, uh, opportunities for um, deeply, deeply discounted tickets uh, for, for all of you who are advocates uh, and are part of uh, our community. Uh, and so we hope that uh, you might be able to join us uh, in, uh, in DC, but we have this event and then you're going to see more of us don't worry the uh the circle of stars remember that from last year that'll be coming up in in december and just have a, a lot of things happening so uh, uh i i look forward to the, the i i've got a little sneak preview from jen and susan of some of the things that she just teased about activities uh next year and i'm really really excited to hear more about that jen thanks tom all right susan just a quick update on affiliates Hello, everybody. We want to let you know that we have added another affiliate to our affiliate network, and Facets has joined us. This is super exciting for us, and we can see lots of room for partnership and moving forward together and serving the community, um, the FDSD community and families and individuals. So a big thank you to them and looking forward to where the future takes us. Back to Jim. Woohoo! Feels like a newscast. Yeah, it might be the weather person. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so looking at, um, you know, right now we are in kind of that lull between um, election, um, waiting for the election to happen and then seeing what's going to happen on the other side based on, um, you know, which party controls the House, which party controls the Senate and in where our champion, current champions sit. Um, you know, are they in? Are they out? Um, where are we going to be? And Jim, so I don't want to interrupt, but it kind of reminds me of the eye of the hurricane because you've got the, the one side and then you've got we're like in the middle where there's it's really quiet and you can go outside and relax and then all of a sudden, you know, it, it starts up again. So that's kind of uh, a good analogy. In, in <laughs> A very okay. apropos analogy. Apropos I, yeah, analogy. Yeah. I, I think November is going to be an extremely busy month and our advocacy, particularly towards the FASD Respect Act, is, is never going to be more important than it will be in November. And definitely the outreach that we're doing now, even continuing doing uh, pre-election is important. We're just not going to see much movement on anything 
until post-election. So um, at any rate, we, uh, we got to thinking about, um, and welcome Jill, um, glad you're here, uh, what we can look at in, uh, in 2023. So um, one of the areas we want to focus on is a, kind of an expansion of the state sheets and looking at doing some state report cards, not reporting in and giving grades on the work that you all are doing, uh, obviously not, but giving kind of a um, empirically uh, sorted lay of the land for each state. Um, looking at um, measurable objectives on where the state is in terms of getting to where it needs to be uh, for FASD policy. Um, so um, we're looking at getting this laid out and, and rolled out next year um, in a collaborative manner and having it available uh, as a tool uh, to use to further advocacy. Um, you know, again, sim very similar to the state sheets. And I've noticed that a lot of you have taken the state sheets and kind of used that data to, and if you're not familiar with the state sheets, on the, uh, the policy website, each state has a, an information sheet on how FASD uh, is impactful in uh, each individual state. And um, this is looking at kind of an expansion on that. So if you haven't had a chance to go to the policy website yet and download your state's sheet, and again, if you wanna make changes or corrections or you feel like there's something off on there, please tell me. Um, this is not meant to be FASD United telling you what's going on in your state. It's meant to be really, you know, here's some information. Let's make sure it's accurate and current with what's going on in your state and make sure that the information we're presenting is helpful to the policies and initiatives that you ah. want to be completing in your own state. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, oh, sorry, I, go ahead, Susan. Well, and I just want to say, I, we, you know, we got the idea. I saw this one uh, that had to do with America's school mental health report card, and it was called the Hopeful Futures Campaign. And they selected eight policy areas and then graded uh, the states uh, in those policy areas. And this is not something that's a one and done kind of thing. And maybe I'm jumping ahead here, Jen. It's something that will be because <laughs> we, uh, it's something that will be ongoing and particularly as states utilize the funding from the RESPECT Act and what they do with it. And so um, we'll, uh, we can, we can send out or maybe put that link in so people can see what uh, a report, you know, that report card looks like. Um, Absolutely. And yeah, I will get that out in the chat in just a moment. But um, really, you know, if we, if you don't know where you are, how do you know where you're going to go? Right? Like and Alice so, in Wonderland. Anybody? Exactly. Yeah, and any road will get you there. Yeah. So this really is um, just a mechanism and, and an ongoing mechanism to be able to see how we're progressing down that road, both on a national level and on a state by state level. Um, and we can use this information in so many different ways. Um, so um, looking at things that it might measure. Um, so um, some of the key areas we were thinking about was looking at diagnostic capacity in each state. So. Oh. How many diagnosis, uh, diagnostic clinics are there um, in, uh, in each state? Um, are there any diagnostic capacity available for adults? Um, that's, a, that's a huge issue that we see regularly. Um, the child protection laws in the state, um, they are arguably there to protect the child, but are they protecting the child at the expense of people with FASD? Are they, you know, are they punitive going against the research? Um, are there, is, is there an FASD United affiliate or are there agencies or organizations that are focused on FASD in the state? Um, what kind of infrastructure is there to support people with FASD? So I thought we'd open it up to a discussion on what types of things would you feel would be important to measure in these state report cards? Um, and you're welcome to uh, unmute yourself, throw it in the chat, raise your hand. I will do my best to get to uh, everybody and take notes at the same time. Um, but I think this is um, 
kind of an important uh, consideration. You know, we can create these state report cards that work well for us, but we want we want them to be workable for all of you too. There's no sense in us doing uh, doing one thing that just does one thing, right? Let, let's figure out how to make this data work for everybody. So um, yeah, please, if you have any thoughts, suggestions, ideas um, on, on things, uh, uh, areas we should measure, um, I would definitely love to, uh, to hear that from you. Or even thoughts on the report card in general. And don't everybody talk at once, please, because that's really hard to handle. I have my hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, Kathy. <laughs> I did not see your hand. <laughs> I always have something to say. Um, no, I have several ideas. One is um, the um, screening and evaluation as appropriate of children entering the foster care system, mm -hmm. um, policies about posting about the dangers of alcohol. Um, for example, in North Carolina, we have that in ABC stores, which is liquor, but not in all the myriad of places that sell wine and beer. And um, we don't have anything in restaurants um, either. Uh, so that is really limited. And I had another one, but my cat won't stop meowing. I can't remember, but I miss Dexter. <laughs> Next I month, Dexter. <laughs> Dexter. Awesome. Dexter. Yeah, go ahead. Carl, you had your hand up. Yes, um, I did post it in chat, but we could put uh, information regarding pending legislation in the various states, you know, similar to what California has done with 1016, I think it's 1016. Um, you know, like we have three pending bills coming up in our session starting in January. Um, in other states, I'm working with somebody in Kansas now to look at possible legislation for their state um, so that we can recognize those states that are actually making an effort to enact change uh, that's appropriate for the population we're working with. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So I know under the policy site, we do have a section for state legislation. I would love to be able to populate that more if I okay. have the information. So well, please we will, yeah. send in it my some, way. In quite a few places, we're going to have to find people locally to get their legislators locally to introduce legislation. Uh, yeah. But once we're successful in multiple states like Kansas or North Dakota, we can help with other states to get that happening. Yeah, and that's and Carl, you're kind of ahead of the next part of the, the agenda. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, this that is, wasn't planned. <laughs> this, this is, you know, pick. You have to be simple, I think, with the report card. You know, they yes. on the one we're going to share with you had eight policy, and then there's, uh, and so what are the most important things that we want to know about this mm -hmm. field in every state in the union, so we can use. Whatever information that is, we can you can use it in your states and you can use it in we can use it in Congress to say, yes. you know, this state got an F. You know, there's more states that are getting Fs in this particular, in this particular uh, policy area. And well, in and response to Julia yeah. posted that she agreed with my thought, but would measure state legislation that it's already passed. Yeah. And there's yeah. not, I think California is one of the first to pass yeah. legislation specifically targeted to FASD. Um, it would be nice to be able to just address legislation that's already been passed, but there's not a lot of it. Well, that's, that's where they're going to get a low grade. And, so, yeah. and, then, and then it'll be, this will be a tool that we can use to, to track how states are doing with the FA, you know, if they've applied for the funding. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm talking too much in yep. the, and nope. it's in the bill, which, you know. But that's all I had for, for now anyway. No, I love right. it. Yeah. And Kathy White, you got your hand up? Kathy's got her hand up. I do. Hello. Good to see everyone. I'm not able to look at that tool since I'm driving with the sick kid, but I wondered if there's a way, not that it's about numbers, but I 
feel like sometimes with other families here that there are other local families, so maybe to keep track of, if I use that, I can be a swear word for some of us sometimes, but um, numbers of families that um, a state may be supporting or advocating for or um, in contact with. I don't know, just an idea. Yeah, I think that makes sense yeah. what I'm I think what you're asking is, you know, could we know how many families are are impacted in the state and yes. uh, are are looking for support? And I think that's a little harder number to get to, um, especially with the HIPAA and privacy laws. But I um, I think some manner of looking at the scope of what we're dealing with in each state is um, definitely something that would be helpful to have on the uh, have on the report card. Um, you know, this would be something where, you know, if you have one shot to speak with a legislator, um, what could you show them? What, what information could you give them on how the state is performing, um, both good and, and poorly, um, when it comes to this particular topic? So, you know, if you do think of some additional ideas, if you, you know, leave this call and you're like, oh boy, it'd be great if we knew this in each state and how my state compared, um, you know, please shoot me an email. I'm going to go ahead and throw my email address down in the chat, although I'm sure all of you already have it. Uh, and just let me know um, what some things are that you'd like, you'd like to have added. Anybody um, else have comments? Uh, yeah. Oh, please, Annette. I've had my hand up. I don't know oh, if you can see it. I can't. It's buried in your F. Oh, it's buried. Uh, so I oh, apologize. No wonder it doesn't work. Okay. Um, I had some ideas about, um, well, I would like to know if the state, if somehow um, it's included for, in, for insurance reimbursement. I'm not mm. sure where that comes up, but, you know, it, what we're finding, we really only have what I, I, I mean, two clinics, but I I think we only have real one real FASD clinic in California with a population of 39 and a half million. I just read a, a research report that Canada, which has a similar population, just slightly under California, I think they're about 39.2 million. They were complaining and saying that with almost six, 60, almost 60 clinics of some form or other in Canada, it's not enough capacity. <laughs> Here in California, we have more population and we really only have capacity in Southern California. There's nothing in Central and Northern California. So anyway, I love this idea of the report card. Um, but what I'm finding at those two, a couple of the clinics or doctors where they do the assessments or can do the assessments, um, it's for Medi-Cal. You know, so people with private insurance can't get an evaluation or any other services reimbursed. This is a major developmental disability, and I think it should be included in the insurance air arena. And I know nothing about the insurance, I'm very little about the insurance industry and how that policy gets included. But I, I think Minnesota has been working on something like this. Um, so that's one idea on the insurance. And then the other is I would want to survey where um, which states include FASD in their um, child find or early start identification. Hmm. That's because for, that does for us, what are for our, the, the agency that is responsible for um, developmental disability services is called the regional centers here in California and under the Department of Devel Developmental Services. Um, for the first time, and I, I'm not sure it came from within the, that, um, that department, but they, for the first time, they, they revised the definition of um, a child with a delay. So, you know, early start is to find those children who have a delay to some point in certain um, developmental areas. Mm -hmm. And so in California, um, the regional centers received an increase in their budget uh, and they expanded the definition of early start. So early start is if you have a delay in certain areas, like they and they changed some of the categories. They broke uh, language into expressive and receptive language, which you know that's critical for our population. So if there's like a twenty, and they reduce the the delay. So it used to be thirty three percent delay. They re reduce it down to a twenty five percent delay. 
So that expands, you know, the, the, the clients that they can serve. Then they also included for the first time, they included fetal alcohol syndrome, they included FAS. Um, uh, and, and we are going to work to change that to FASD. But they at least included FASD as the type of developmental disability that has, you know, delays in certain areas. So it was actually named in the definition. And that's for the first time. So that's huge. So that I think that should be measured as well as um, then, of course, um, whether FASD is actually codified in the education code. And um, I think Alaska has, has it as FASD. Um, Jen pointed out that New Mexico has it, but it's FAS. Um, and now California has FASD under other health impaired. So those are the only three states that I know that actually mention it. Colorado, of course, you know, their interpretation of other health impaired includes FASD. So those are just a few of the areas that I think we should survey. The other thing I want to mention along these lines is that one of our partners uh, with the FASD now, the Alliance in California, Sid Gardner at Child, Children and Family Futures, um, did a survey earlier this year of all the California agencies asking about their policy and practice with regard to FASD. So he went out to all the agencies, 20 some, I think, um, to ask what they're doing. His report is going to be coming out soon. So that could also be kind of a blueprint or, or, or guideline to help us uh, develop these report cards. Absolutely. That's some really great information, Annette. Thank you. And I think, you know, we're really closely following what's going on in California and the work they're doing there because, um, you know, this is some great momentum that hopefully we can uh, utilize to transition into other states and, and have a similar momentum into other states. So, um, and, and that was the other thing I, I also, because the legislation we're working on for next year, um, where we're laying the, we're laying the seeds and we're drafting policy right now is to have the state level FASD coordinator uh, who will, who will convene an interagency coordinating body. So I think that should also be included on the report card. That's it, whether you have a task force or a coordinator or somebody at a state level. At the state level FASD. that has, that is working on a plan for the state. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Gigi, you had your hand up? Uh, yeah. Um, I'm thinking if there's some way, which I know is hard because there are many misdiagnosed or undiagnosed, to quantify what it costs each state. Um, because when people see those big dollars, it, it opens their mm -hmm. eyes. Um, and I know that like when you did those state-by-state -state sort of fact sheets, you kind of uh, interpolated to get to that number. But I feel like that you know, hits people where it hurts. I, I think that's definitely an item we need to keep and maintain and continue to review um, in that report card going forward and just have that information. Um, you know, maybe we give a grade based on how much money the state puts into FASD versus how much money the state, you know, yeah how much money they put into programs supporting versus how much they're paying or some sort of variation on that, I think would be really uh, insightful and helpful. Uh, well, I, but I think it's important to like for the big picture, you know, what is, mm -hmm. what does it cost to have them incarcerated? What is it costing homeless addiction programs? All those, because that's a much bigger number than we know the states aren't putting in enough, very much money at all, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. It has to be something we can measure. So I know. You know, until until you have identification uh, and diagnosis, it's, it's going to I know be, it's kind of like a catch twenty two. Yeah, I mean, you we've got our economic cost studies, and that's what those numbers that they came from. Uh, and I think those could very well be updated. Um, you know, because that, that's that's you know, and you know, we mentioned that a lot in our meetings, uh, the state numbers as well as the the big number. And it's hard for people to get their heads around it. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we did our work in Minnesota, I, I tried to get information from the state on, you know, all those kinds of indicators. Uh, and then you apply what the prevalence is. And that's how we, how we came up with numbers. Yeah. Um, maybe you could do something like that on each of those categories. So. Good points, Gigi. And, and monitoring the chat, Teresa had a good point uh, about the ICD-10 and, diag and diagnostic codes. And I think, um, you know, without 
completely sidetracking this conversation, one of the areas that may impact the, the uh, diagnostic codes is this pro a project that's happening with the Department of Defense and looking at FASD in the military healthcare system, because that is a standalone, for lack of better term, insurance company um, that is looking and actively researching how they're going to handle FASD appropriately in that system. And looking at the codes, looking at how that's all handled there. And when autism became more in the forefront, that's what happened. That's how they got there, was looking at FASD in the military healthcare system, or looking at, at, at autism in the military healthcare system. So that's why we were so excited about that particular project. But I, I digress. Um, so... Um, <laughs> Lots to talk about this time. Um, it, it, are there any other comments or ideas or thoughts that we should put? I've got a, a nice list going here, and, and we've got another list uh, that I've already started. Um, any other comments or thoughts or suggestions on what you feel like would be helpful to include in this state report card? I would like to pipe up and say, hey there, um, diagnostic capacity. Mm -hmm is not just my thing but it's huge because all of the other things are contingent on a diagnosis we can't access whatever services are in place without the diagnosis first so the lack of diagnostic capacity is i think going to be huge yeah i would say that'd probably be number one on the list <laughs> in my opinion. Um, and, and definitely, I think that's a, a, a really good point. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know if there's any state out there that would get a passing grade on that, but um, <laughs> so um, Rome wasn't built in a day. Uh, and this is a very ambitious project that we're wanting to take on, but I think necessary, useful, and something that's going to need to continually be updated. Um, and so looking at um, kind of a timeline for how this might happen, um, I, Susan and I have been going through it and looking at, um, you know, this quarter, really looking at, okay, what areas of policy do we want to focus on with this report card? And what's the rubric? How are we empirically measuring the data? It's not an opinion, but you know, here's the facts. This is how this is handled. Um, first quarter next year, we'd look at starting data collection. So, um, you know, getting all of this information together, and that's going to take some doing because, as as much as you all each know your individual states, you can't always draw a connect a straight line between this service in this state means this service in that state, state means this service in that state. They all have different ways of doing it. And then there's Texas, um, <laughs> which has its own way of doing everything. So um, finding those areas where we can draw those connecting lines and find those straight lines between them is, is gonna, be, gonna be some work. Um, second quarter, we'd be looking at doing some collaborative review really coming back to you with, wait, hey, here's the data. Here's what we've come up with. Here's what we have. Um, is this accurately representing your state? Is there more information that we need to find? Uh, is this really doing what it needs to be doing? And then looking to publish in time for um, third quarter uh, next year. So, you know, having something for September, for FASD Awareness Month, for Hill Day, for um you know, the 50th anniversary of, of FASD, FASD Awareness Month, um, you know, there's a lot going on there, but having that information. And then fourth quarter, we'd roll right back into, okay, now let's review the data again. Let's go back to those data points and see if anything's changed since we got the data in quarter one. And then in 2020, 2024, we'll have the opportunity to publish an update and see where we've gotten. So that really making this be kind of an ongoing um, state of the nation, as it were, um, state of the state um, process that is just continually updating and continually moving and looking at all these data points. So any thoughts on any of this? Um, you know, this is kind of in the in initial phase, phases. So before we get too far down a road that might be the wrong path or might be a really great path, but what if you thought of this? 
this is really an opportunity for you to weigh in and uh, give some initial thoughts or suggestions. And I, I would just say, and I would, well, let me just say, I think we have to start simple uh, and then I can, and what, what is measurable and what will take for take forever to, to do. And then, you know, there are, as, you know, Annette mentioned, there's a lot of nuances in policy in different states and trying to, you know, figure that out could be more than, you know, we have the resource to, resources to do. So it's got to be simple but impactful. So just on those um, you know, cautions, I guess, would be the yeah, we can yeah. we can add questions every year. We can yeah. add, you know, um, you know, and so it's maybe areas, you know, pick out different, you know, education, justice, you know, disability, those areas and how they're how they're handled. So sorry, Carl, I think you were saying something and I interrupted you. Yeah, no, no, I was trying not to interrupt you. I was just gonna say there's a lot of things that we can request through freedom of information from the various states. Uh, we'll have to be narrow in our focus so that they know we're not trying to get private data, uh, but rather publicly interpretable health data, which is entirely different. Um, some states like North Dakota will be difficult, and that's because the system that we had been using uh, up until this last year did not allow that data to be quantified. <laughs> so, anyway, but yeah, just a thought there, because um, otherwise they're going to say, you know, it's all protected by HIPAA. And there's a lot of things that are protected by HIPAA, but there's a lot of things that aren't. And we're not looking for privately identifiable data. So, no, no. Right. Yeah. And, and again, this is not a research project uh, in terms of academic research. Um, so slightly different. This is, uh, but this is data driven, and we want to make sure that the data is accurate and that we can cite it back to its source, and that we are the information we're putting out is verifiable uh, and in and, and true data too. So, um, and we'll, yeah, send, we'll send the other the link for the other report card so you can get an idea of how, what they did for uh, school mental health policy. I am worried about how ambitious what you listed is, Jen, to do in one quarter, two quarter, you know, and have something yeah. out by September, because unless we have more hands than we have, uh, that's, that's, you know, that's going to take a lot of digging and um, a lot of person hours. And I, I just would like to see us start with some things that aren't so difficult together. Yeah. yeah, that is such a good point, Kathy. And I really appreciate you bringing that up. And I think that's why, you know, sometimes perfection can be the enemy of progress. Um, and we are going to need to justifiably start small on this. Um, you know, this may be three categories to start with instead of the eight that this other organization did. Um, you know, we are hopeful that um, uh, you will be able to have some additional hands on deck to be able to help with this. Um, and yeah, absolutely. You know, Susan and I argued back and forth over this timeline that in Susan said, that's ridiculous, Jen, you're never going to be able to do this. And um, my point in publishing it is not to say, oh, FASD United, you missed that deadline. Oh my gosh, you guys are terrible. My point in publishing it is that if we don't have a goal to shoot for, you know, I, I, I want to have an ambitious goal to shoot for in getting something out and getting something done, because I think we do need this, but I think you're spot on that it needs to be smaller in scope to start with. Let's figure out how to do it this first year, and then we can add to it in years prior, years after. There are, there are aspirations, and then there are things that we can do in a given time period. And I agree with having a goal, but having a goal that we feel like we failed at is, is not very helpful. Um, and I just, I just, uh, it worries me um, because so many of us, if nothing else, 
our parents and you know things don't really go on a straight line in our lives <laughs> could i add a, a point here and, and just maybe one of the justifications for for wild ambition at, at this stage is that so that we can show our current funders uh, and 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 prospects uh what we have in mind and really all that could be accomplished with the understanding of course that um it would happen in phases but this gives us a chance to show uh what this could be uh and interest funders so as i said so we can first tr try to turn some of our existing funding towards this project another reason why you know janet and the team wanted to talk with you today to get your feedback to to really embellish this uh uh, and make it all that it can be conceptually, but exactly right. You will have to match the two, <laughs> the funding uh, and the ambition, uh, which which we'll do. Well, and ideally, once we have these out for the states, we can then, um, you know, you at a state level can use this data to help drive funding in your own state. Um, so, sorry, Kathy, you look like you were going to say something. I also wanted to point out when the FASD Respect Act passes this fall, we are going to have a lot of work to do. And this adds another layer to it. And some of it may be helpful in the pursuit of those or pursuit of those things that we need to get on board right away to do to get funding funneled to our states. But I think that's a good segue, don't you, Jen? I, I think that's a really valid point too, Kathy. Um, so one of the, the other things we're looking at and is almost completed is having um, a legislative template uh, for um, codifying a state advisory council or commission or um, person dealing with uh, FASD at the state level. Um, Susan's writing up some draft language that can be used in uh, you know, any state, obviously with changes for that particular state, but um, that can be used to help start that process of implementing the FASD Respect Act. Um, so the state has to have a state council. Um, we, don't, we don't know what the language is gonna look like yet, but some sort of state council on FASD that is driven by the state agencies, not by us. Um, but to get that, you got to have funding on the state level or on the federal level. And typically having it codified as opposed to a governor's proclamation or a proclamation from an office holder is a more sustainable way to go. So we're working on draft legislation that we can get out to you once we know what the final language uh, that gets through um, a passage of the FASD Respect Act is, we can mirror that and, and get that out to you so you can start working on um, legislation in your own states to get those task force, um, whatever they're going to be called, advisory councils, commissions, um, codified in, in, in your own state. So some steps that you can take right now is really reaching out and looking at legislative champions. In a couple of weeks, you're gonna know who's gonna be serving in your state post-election. Um, getting to know those folks, um, contacting and connecting with, uh, you know, like um, Annette was saying, yeah, he reached out to um, uh, 20 different state agencies, finding out where they were. Well, building those connections and relationships with the state level agency stakeholders I think is another really good thing that you can be working on right now, because if you have an agency that's opposed to what you're doing, that could be a problem. That can be a barrier or a blocker to getting your bill passed. Um, and then working together to build a coalition um, in your state. Um, again, this is something that FASD Now did a really great job of getting all these different organizations together. Some of them didn't get along. Um, some, most of them did, but, you know, like getting everybody together to work forward. Um, this isn't something that one person alone can do. Um, you know, if, if that could have happened, the FASD Respect Act would have been passed ages ago. Um, it takes all of us working together to get this done. So, um, yeah, that's... I just, I, and I just want to add on the, uh, on the template that it has you know, it has to be simple. Uh, it, and 
and uh, because anytime you you have something that's got a lot of language uh then it, it really delays it i think it, so that's kind of made the goal is to have something simple that you can you know you can give a legislator and they can send it for drafting uh and and you can get it going right away but i so that's our goal is to make it simple and then states can use it and jen's right we won't know you know until we have the language and that'll get into the next item on the agenda yeah so we are um running a little shorter on time than i initially had thought we would um, we were planning on doing a little bit of discussion around what other legislative templates might you find helpful. Um, I don't want to cut that short, but I do want to get to some updates on the Respect Act. So um, maybe we'll swing back to the discussion uh, after we give the updates on the Respect Act. And in the meantime, if you have any thoughts, suggestions, ideas on uh, other legislative templates uh, for, for state policy that you might find helpful, um, send them, send them my way. I'll, I'll bring them out to the policy team and we'll see what we can come up with. Um, you know, again, I'm not going to promise anything overnight. Um, I think we've bitten off enough with the state, uh, uh, the state report cards. Um, that's going to be a very big project, but, um, you know, definitely something we want to look at there. So, um, the Respect Act, the main event. <laughs> Breaking news. I wish I had that little beep, 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 beep thing they have on the news to go with it. Um, so currently we have, um, we've broken through the health committee, the Senate health committee. Um, we currently have um, the uh, committee staff uh, for uh, Senators Murray and Burr collaborating on approved language for inclusion into the omnibus. Um, that is huge, meaning that the FAA, there is every indication that the FASD Respect Act will make it out of the Senate Health Committee this year. Um, that's never wow. happened. Um, <laughs> that's super <laughs> exciting. Um, I am crossing my fingers, my toes, my armpits, my elbows, you name it. Um, but uh, the work that we've done there as collectively as a nation in bringing FASD to the um, to the eyes, ears, and hearts of our legislators uh, is, is paying off. Um, we have had indicators from staff on both Murray and, um, and Burr's teams uh, saying that they feel like something needs to be done on FASD this year. Um, so very cautiously optimistic there, or very optimistic, less caution there uh, than I ever have been in the past. Um, we did have a letter go out to the Energy and Commerce uh, Subcommittee of the House, uh, where our bill also needs to get through uh, signaling that the Senate is moving on this and the Senate is um, uh, making some some roads on it. So um, that's super exciting. Um, well, we all, Jen, I just want to add to that. When we were in um, uh, DC, we met with uh, Representative McCollum and shared you know, what was going on in the Senate. And she really, because uh, we had a letter that was going to come from uh, from uh, House members of the committee asking for some uh, movement. And she really approved of uh, the approach, what's going on in the Senate and to you know, encourage the leadership in the energy and commerce to, um, to take it up. And she was going to talk to uh, Eshu and to McMorris Rogers. Okay. You can well that, that leads into our next uh piece um kathy mcmorris rogers is ranking republican on committee in the house uh she is serving out of washington state my home state um and has a child with down syndrome um and we have made some good inroads with her uh in terms of uh getting her aware of the situation aware of the bill um hopefully having some movement forward. I, I met with her former district director who just happens to be the aunt of an individual with FASD, shockingly. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so um, she's uh, doing some uh, some lobbying work with us on that too. So um, really excited about that because that's somebody we needed to get on board to push things through. Pallone and, and Eshu are fairly, um, 
aware on board. Uh, California's done a great job of uh, reaching out to Representative Anna Eshoo, and, and Anna Eshoo's comments were that you need to make inroads with CMR, with Kathy McMorris Rogers, so um, which we are doing there. And uh, Pallone, who uh, is the chair of the um, Energy and Commerce Committee, is, uh, used to sit on the FASD caucus. So, um, and has indicated that, uh, you know, he understands what's going on there too. So I think this is all really great momentum and um, like we're in uncharted waters with, uh, with the bill because, um, you know, we've had bills introduced year after session, after session, after session with really not a lot of movement. And we are seeing that movement and that movement is a really a direct result of all of the work that all of you have been doing out there in your states with your legislators. So thank you. Um, my my little, last little piece and update on this is that um, I really encourage you to get out to vote. I don't care who you vote for. That is not my business, not my call, not my purview. But uh, election day is coming up. Please vote. So um, I'm going to skip past this one. These are just meetings that we've had with the Energy and Commerce uh, Health Subcommittee. Um, if you see some folks there that uh, have not been met with yet, please do uh, do your best to reach out and let's see if we can get them on board. Um, whoop, back up. Um, previous screen, goodness. You'd think I'd be better at this. I thought I, um, so these are some ones that we still need to have. Um, And um, these are our current Senate sponsors. Nothing's changed here recently, although I think we might get a few more on um, post-election. And uh, House members, we did add a, a Republican in August Fluger uh, and VC in, uh, those were both in September. Um, as the House has been in recess for the month of October, we haven't had any new additions in October. Um, however, we know that there are some coming, um, and I am missing a slide here. Um, we have um, uh, Doris Matsui in California coming on board. We have uh, Representative Horsford, uh, who is a Democrat from uh, Nevada, and we have uh, Representative, it's not Fluger, it's um, Julia, help me out here, he indicated um, Repo another Republican from Texas uh, that indicated it's Fallon. Here. Fallon, thank you. Um, I apologize. I must have uh, not remembered to highlight that slide so you, you all could see it. But uh, so we're up to um, uh, 65 members of the House that have signed on and nine in the Senate. Uh, in my constituents in Montana, and I are working to establish meetings before Christmas. So, Brilliant. Yeah, uh, just as a heads up. Yeah, uh, we're up to six families in Montana now that are going to work to meet with their legislative reps. So that's more than I had three weeks ago. <laughs> so, that is awesome. Yeah, we're quite excited. <laughs> and those of you who are working um, at an affiliate or with us, you know, an organization that covers the state, you don't have to have a constituent if you're covering the state. Um, that is no. one thing that um, right. I'm, I've learned with uh, Kathy McMorris Rogers. Um, you know, I was trying desperately to get a constituent, desperately to get a constituent. And then uh, I was meeting with a, a lobbyist that I know. Um, and they said, no, 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 you cover the state. You're good. Go in there. Um, so, and yes, Kathy, some might not schedule with you unless you have a constituent in the meeting. Um, and a, a, a workaround for that is if you can email the, uh, the person themselves, the, the person handling the health portfolio themselves, um, sometimes you can get in that way. Not always, but sometimes. Um, yeah, not in North Carolina. <laughs> nope. So looking at the legislative calendar, it is going to be a busy end of the year. Um, you know, how Tom was talking earlier about how, um, you know, we're, we're in kind of that lull right now. Uh, the Senate was in session, yes. Um, <laughs> but really, once November 14th hits, that is when things are going to start flying and going crazy. 
um, with legislation going through. So I may be a little harder to connect with at that point. I'm going to apologize in advance. Um, and I may be reaching out to you saying, hey, can you get an email out to this person right away? Or, you know, we're just going to need to be really fluid and really agile and um, really prepared to reach out and get this bill put through um, and included in the omnibus. Um, I think we can do it. I think this is our year. Um, I think we're there. I think we've done all the work that we needed to do. Um, but uh, we're going to be very busy in November and December. So, uh, uh, Jen, yeah, is, there, is there anything we can do with respect to the work and getting this included in the omnibus? I think continued reach, uh, reaching out to your legislators, even if definitely the ones that haven't signed on, okay. um, following up again, having another meeting, um, you know, they probably won't do anything post or pre-election. No, no, um, I noticed nobody's responding right now. Exactly. And it, people it, are it, taking time off. Yes. <laughs> they're taking time off to campaign in district. Yeah. Is, is what's going on. Well, there. their staff seems to be gone. Yes, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, as soon as the election is over, we want to be in there pushing, pushing, pushing. Okay. Um, and uh, just renewing your calls to get things done. I'll have another text to connect piece going out uh, post election. Um, so keep your eyes open for that. And for those of you that don't know, that's just a way of sending a letter to your legislators, uh, your two senators, and your rep. Um, if I ever do a TikTok dance, that's going to be at your two senators and your rep. Um, but uh, you can send out a letter to them directly through text. It's been really effective, um, super easy for people to do. Um, yes, Carl. That's a TikTok dance we could stitch and do across all of the affiliates. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <I just> had... <laughs> we had to digress into TikTok dances. That's my fault. <laughs> At any rate, um, we'll, we'll look to have that out uh, going forward. So um, legislators who lose their reelections and didn't run again, they got nothing to lose. They have everything to gain in terms of their, um, their status and their you know, just doing the right thing. Um, they may have more bandwidth to be able to move uh, on legislation uh, if, they, if they lose. You know, it it does definitely it's doesn't mean it's over. Congress. It's a lame duck Congress, so you you know, a lot can happen in a lame duck Congress. So. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, thank you all for being here. I really appreciate giving us an hour of your day. I know you're all really busy doing the great work that you do around the country. Um, as always, my my virtual door is open. Please connect with me if there's anything I can do to help support you and your state policy efforts. Um, you don't have to do this alone. Um, I think so often working in our states, we feel like oh, we're all alone here working on this. It's It can be hard. You, you are not alone. Just like we say to parents and families and individuals with FASD, let us connect you. Um, let us let us support. So please reach out if there's anything I can do to help, if there's anything I can do to support. Um, if you have any ideas or suggestions that we weren't able to get out loud during the, the conversation and the open discussion we had today, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, there, there are wiser minds than mine in the room, and I, I'd love to hear from them. <laughs> so um, thank you again. I'm going to go ahead and stay on the call for another, uh, you know, 10 minutes or so, just in case somebody wants to stay on and give me their thoughts there. Um, but I am so grateful for everyone who turned up today and everyone who's been continually working on this. And um, you are very much appreciated. So thank you. And I would I would echo what Jen says. It's been, an, when I think back to the beginning when we started this, it's been an incredible ride. I mean, it's, I, I think that we need to, Jen and I probably need to write a book on it, but we don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> Too busy getting you know, policy work done. <laughs> when when the uh, omnibus passes with our bill in it, we need to have a party. Yes, yeah. we do. Yeah, we a do. big, yeah. yeah. And I must say, if you're inclined to want to go to DC mid-November, it might be an opportune time to do a little more knocking on the doors. I feel a really good time for Hill Day. Yep. Um, so I'll be there with my red shoes. Me too. <laughs>
All right, I'm going to stop um, sharing. I'm going to stop recording if that's okay.